Okay, um, oh, this is fun. Welcome to the last activity of Ultim Academy in our Wunderkammer. Um, I'm very pleased to have with us tonight uh, David Hoop. David is a composer, writer, performer, also a teacher, many other things. You'll discover more about his manifold activity throughout this talk. So he is here at the festival. Um, is present in two productions. The one was um, a work by uh, Camille Lamont, or a collaboration between Camille Lamont and David mm -hmm. It was presented at the Office for Contemporary Art today, this afternoon. Maybe some of you have been there. And in that case, uh, it would be very interesting to have you participate a bit in this discussion. And uh, the second work we presented, um, not, maybe I missed uh, one, Tuesday evening. Uh, and it is um, a work um, called Leonardo that is developed together with the singer Ellen Michener. So maybe we could start uh, talking about uh, about uh, Leonardo mm -hmm. because uh, Leonardo Leonardo da Vinci is um, an interesting figure. We're talking here about the connection between nature, science, arts, as uh, and as we previously discussed. So why don't you tell us, how did this work come about? How mm. Well, I, I have to give some context, really. And part of the context is that um, I had written an opera called Star-Shaped Biscuit. And I was looking for singers who were not opera singers. <coughs> and uh, one of the singers I found by just going to concerts um, to hear people I didn't know was Elaine Mitchell. And I liked her voice very much because of the various things I could hear in it. I could hear some trace of gospel, which in fact turned out to be very much to do with her family background. She grew up in a family of Seventh-day Adventists, Afro-Caribbean Seventh-day Adventists, and had this history of uh, gospel singing and also some jazz and blues and R&B. But also I sensed that she was probably classically trained, which was also true. And that diversity really attracted me. So I said, why don't we talk? And as it turned out, she was one of the three singers who sang in my opera. Um, she was uh, the recipient of a three-month residency in Venice a few years ago. And she said to me, uh, can you write a piece for me that I can perform at the end of the residency, you know, so I can bring together everything that happens in the residency um, into a presentation at the end. And we talked about various ideas, you know, very generally about Italy and <laughs> Venice and so on. But there was a wider context of, of other conversations we had had, which were more like um, the state of things, I suppose. I mean, one of the things we had talked about was um, that there were virtually no people of colour in the classical music world in the UK. You know, I mean, she was such an exception. And, it, you know, it's a difficult thing. Um, she always felt like the stranger in the room in, in the events she was attending. Um, she was at that time working for a music publisher recording. Um, and, you know, these kind of conversations about the state of things and um, my feeling about the music situation, conditions in music or sound work, as I prefer to call it, um, were very much the background of, of this um, idea of what to do. Now, we had tea together just before she went to Venice. and. After we had tea, I went into a local bookshop and I picked up a book which was a biography of Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, just idly. And I opened it at a page and there was a, a, a vision Leonardo had had of a bird when he was a baby, a bird flying into his mouth and drumming in his mouth. I mean, this is a, f 
uh, following on from this wonderful talk about Nassim, uh, uh, you know, this was a this really struck me. This story. This was a this was a vision. A it was a, it, well, he, he he claimed it was uh, something that actually happened to him, but it, of course it sounds like a dream. I opened another page. I mean, this is absolutely true. I opened two pages in this book, and the second one was this apocalyptic vision of a black giant rising up in, in Libya. Um, and I thought, OK, I'll buy this book. <laughs> and this seems, I mean, you know, there was a loose Italian collection. You know, Leonardo was not a Venetian, but it seemed a starting point for a piece. So did these images generate the beginning of an idea of sound, or how did the connection why did you think they could be interesting for the project? The bird part was because I've always been interested in bioacoustics. It's a relationship to human aesthetics. Um, and um, there was something, it, you could almost take it as a psychological case story. You know, it's almost like one of Freud's. Um, case studies of hysteria, something. And, and so, from that point of view, it was fascinating. And the idea of the bird drumming with its tail inside of the mouth was so suggestive of so many things um, that it felt instantly to give me not just musical material or sonic material, but also to give me uh, one of the starting points of uh, libretto. So talking about libretto, let me get back to something that you said um, before. You said you were looking for a singer to make an, an opera, but you wanted a singer without an operatic voice. Or you were interested in, in finding singers without an operatic voice. What, what, why is that? What do you define? Well, um, opera, loosely speaking, means a work or working or to do with work as I understand it, and um, what interested me um, was this idea of this triangulation of, of voice, staging, and sound. And I was actually um, very ignorant of the history of uh, European opera, um, and was somewhat allergic to it. I mean, I. I can actually find good things in virtually any music, but there was a time when I found it very difficult to find anything in opera that uh, I could relate to. I mean, that, that changed, but um, that was the case. And the voice itself, which of course is, is no more unusual than uh, African-American gospel voice or, you know, uh, a Javanese voice that you might hear in the context of Gamelan, um, I found somewhat repellent. Um, and it was a question of breaking through that barrier, you know, to be able to listen to that kind of voice. But the question I had in my mind was, in the 21st century, why can't we have opera with any kind of voice? You know, like a folk music voice, for example, or an R&B voice, or, um, I don't know, any kind of voice. So um, I was looking for singers who were interested in working in this slightly different type of event, but would use, you know, the voice associated with them. So we had a conversation earlier today, and um, you were telling me about your, your, I would say, complicated relationship to opera as a genre and how you try to overcome it. Like it, or not overcome, but like go deeper into this, uh, this, um, this interest for voice and stage, and get a bit more into what um, classical or contemporary opera really is about. Maybe you would like to share. Well, this experience. So, uh, that was a nice, uh, brave. Uh, yeah, uh, overcome is uh, fine. Yeah. You know, I mean, in my twenties, I thought all American country music was terrible. And then I started to listen to some country music, um, Western swing and honky-tonk music, and, and began to think that 
a lot of it was great music. And uh, I mean, music is so interesting because it expresses identity for many people. Um, music is a kind of, it's almost like clothing, it, you know, it, it's, it protects them and it, it um, radiates the kind of, this is who I am feeling. And um, that itself is, is um, incredibly constructive, I think, in, in the way we deal with the world and its difficulties. But uh, of course it also creates divisions. And those divisions can be exacerbated by many things, not least of them the commercialization of music, you know, the selling of music. So a perfect example would be the selling of what was called race music in America. You know, which was basically what they would then have called colored music, you know, African American music. Um, and we would never use the term now race music, and, and music is far less constrained than it used to be for all kinds of complicated reasons. Um, but, you know, we grow up with um, kind of cultural history, the cultural baggage, if you want to put it in a more negative way. And I think um, you can explicitly try to overcome these resistances, you, you know, to expand your own um, aesthetic parameters, if you like. So, you know, opera was one of my last holdout <laughs> problem areas, and I felt you know, what's, what's the big problem? Actually, what happened was um, I was sent some information about an opera writing course some years ago. Uh, and it was sent to me because I get sent lots of stuff, you know. Um, because you teach. It's because I teach, and because I write, and because I'm a person mm -hmm. who, you know, has opinions and so on. So mm -hmm. people think I'll send it to him and something might happen. Which usually it doesn't. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I think they thought, well, he'll show this to his students. Um, I mean, none of my students would be remotely interested in something like that. But I looked at it, Saturday morning the post came, I looked at it and I thought, I want to do this. And um, I talked to friends about it and they said, well, you're mad. I mean, why do you want to do that? But there was something about this... Um, this kind of geometric formulation, voice staging sound, that was compelling to me. And um, I was drawn towards it. And in a way, it was almost like being drawn towards something that you feel a resistance. You feel um, almost a repulsion. And um, the only way to conquer that is to go towards it. You know, rather than back away, um, or from my point of view, most people back away, I guess, um, <laughs> sensible ones. Um, so I did this opera writing course, and it was a kind of, um, it was a mixture of revelation and torment. Um, and there were fantastic people leading the course, Giorgio Battistelli and Harrison Burt Whistle. And, um, you know, I found that the conversations with both Giorgio and Harry, really fantastic. Um, so they have um, just missed like the three week, uh, was it three week course? You know? Three week residential course. So we all kind of, yeah, we all kind of lived in the same, it was like um, reality TV. <laughs> it really was, we were thrown together and you know, it was like hate each other, love each other, sink or swim. Um, so and did, what kind of things did you learn? Like because it's three week course to learn how to write on contemporary opera sounds like <laughs> that's a, yeah, I mean, that's yes, that's not going to happen, is it? But um, speaking personally, yeah. I had really interesting conversations with Harry Burtwistle about notation mm. um, and how to create a piece of music without notation. And he had very interesting thoughts on that. Um, I had a lot of arguments with him, you know, really big arguments with him. And, you know, that's because I'm much older and not older than him, but, <laughs> but you know, I was older than most of the people in, in the 
course and more experienced and kind of um, had a distinct career and um, so I was able to be argumentative but one of the things I learned was how to make an opera very quickly like a three minute opera in you know a couple of hours and that was an extraordinary experience there were singers there that were instrumentalists there and most of them I thought I think I think I'm right in saying that most of them were contemptuous of the students on the course. Why is it so? Just a kind of natural skepticism, I suppose. You know, seen it all and done it all, and what are these people doing? And so, you know, it was a challenge to write something for these people that they would say, yeah, that was okay. <laughs> or even enjoyed doing it. And, so, uh, um, what, uh, what did your experiments consist of and how did you, did you develop them further? After? Well, one of the crazy things about doing mm. this course was that I don't read or write music for notation. Yes. Um, so, mm. you know, you can imagine the mountain I faced. I don't like opera. I can't read or write music. <laughs> Here I am doing a three-week intensive opera writing course. Um, okay, uh, it was difficult, and so you know the level of skepticism that greeted me was enormous. Um, but I was very quickly writing pieces on my laptop for them to perform and devising works in collaboration with um, librettists, uh, playwrights, poets, and so on. Um, that were then very quickly performed and that that discipline encouraged me to think that I could go further in this area and then when the course ended they put out an open call for uh, you know to fund I think five operas and I put in my bid as both composer and librettist and I was one of the people who was successful so there was a sense of miracle in this whole process <laughs> that I was the most inappropriate, ill-equipped person to do this course, yet at the end of it I was supported in composing an opera. And this was the Star, star Shaped Biscuit? It, I wrote an opera called Star Shaped Biscuit, which is, you know, explaining why it was called Star Shaped Biscuit would take sort of 20 minutes, but so we won't do that, but um, it was loosely based on the life of Dora Maar who was a partner of Picasso and a wonderful photographer and artist and whose life interested me. Yes. Um, but it, it had this theme of apocalypse, in it, you know, which is something I guess we all think about and think about ways to respond to that are both practical and that shift our conceptualization of what it actually means to um, believe in climate change, to believe in global warming, to believe in the possibility of some sort of apocalypse for our <coughs> children if we have them, or, you know, somewhere down the line. So you wrote the libretto for this? I wrote the libretto yourself. for that. I wrote the libretto mm -hmm. about a woman who is the last person alive, and she's in a flood. A flood um, without a dove, <laughs> but a flood in which two ghosts um, join her, uh, ghosts from different parts of history. And um, so it's a kind of three-way conversation, although she's not completely aware that the ghosts are there. And this was based on things I was writing about the nature of sound and listening, the ghostly nature of sound. I was writing my last book, Sinister Resonance, at the time, and Sinister Resonance was partly about this idea that sound is a kind of ghost. That whenever you hear it, it's gone. So, you know, if I say ghost, ghost is already in our memory. So this is, um, this is um, what you said, that you were writing a book on listening experience at the time. This makes me think that you, you talked about the triangulation stage, voice, and... Um, Sound. And sound, but I'm thinking that uh, words and the text is probably very important for you in this context as well, because as I know, you are author. You have written numerous books, 
Mm. And many of them also tied to your musical productions, like um, think about the Ocean of Sound, which is yeah. both a book and um, on the ambient music, and if I can say the sort of a history or panorama of ambient music, and then there's a recording tied to it, which is your own experiments. And I wrote, uh, my idea. first book was on hip hop, so that's very much about words and music. So are they, are, do you, are your publications uh, as a writer always interconnected to what you're doing as a musician, or how do you see this, uh, this relationship? Uh, they used to be completely separate, mm -hmm. and um, I would say that um, my state of mind in that time was not particularly healthy, because uh, it was like being two people, and, and there were times in my life when I would almost try to defeat one part of myself. I mean, I became a music journalist for 10, 12 years. But you were already performing. Yeah, I was performing a as a musician, and then I became a music journalist, and I tried to suppress or defeat this side of myself that was a practicing musician. So how did you become a music journalist, and why did you have to forget about your musician side? I, I don't uh, I don't really think you can it's very hard to be a practicing musician if you're a full-time music journalist because you're swamped with other people's music that's one thing and it's very hard to have any credibility um, if, if you're a music journalist and you're a musician people think that your music is probably really terrible um, <laughs> uh, or um, <laughs> If, they, if you become a music journalist, people think that you're a failed musician. And if you're, uh, from the music side of, you, uh, side of things, if you're writing criticism, then musicians regard you with deep suspicion as one of the enemy. This is something to overcome. This is really <laughs> something to overcome. So, um, you know, I did have a 10-year pe period where I tried to really invent myself, reinvent myself, and, you know, it's... It's a very self-destructive thing, and I would say in the last 10, 15 years I've really consciously tried to integrate these two parts of myself, and maybe this uh, compulsion to move towards this formulation of um, voice uh, staging and sound was part of this, I can be really cheesy here and say, healing process, <laughs> but mm. I, I won't do that. <laughs> um, no, just uh, uh, trying to make sense of my own life and what I do, you know, and, and uh, I mean, for God's sake, it's not a misfortune to be able to do two things. It's just, it can be a problem, and uh, you know, you realize that in, the, in a way you're very lucky. So if you think about, um, let's talk about ocean of sound, because it isn't clear parallel here between the writing and the, and the musical experiments. Hmm. How did it start? Was it so that um, you had a particular interest in ambient <laughs> music and a specific idea of, of a sound within it or a texture that you wanted to develop for your music and that then led to more research into, into history? It was about moment. having a secret life. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It was about having a secret life. As a, as a journalist, mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I'd worked for 15 years as an experimental improvising musician, you know, so a world that was almost unknown in this world I went into. I started writing for a magazine called The Face in the, in the 1980s, which was the most fashionable magazine in the world. So suddenly I was working in this... Um, field where everything was excruciatingly fashionable and I've been playing improvised music you know to three people <laughs> you know music that everybody hated at that time and um, and you're so like conscious of I was of in, this acutely fact. conscious yeah. acutely conscious and mm -hmm. I was acutely conscious that some people um, I remember my first wife was very friendly with Neil Tennant from the Pet Shop Boys and um, she had actually worked in New York with him, setting up a magazine when he was a journalist. And Neil came around to dinner one time um, to our flat, and um, Neil said to me, you made a record, didn't you, with, on Brian Eno's label? 
And I thought, how does he know that? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so there was a sense that people could find you out um, yes. if they were as well versed in music as somebody like Neil Tennant, you know, a kind of intellectual of pop music, I would say. Mm -hmm. And a very smart guy, but a very knowledgeable guy. And so I had this kind of secret life. Um, this is like me confessing stuff here. <laughs> um, I had this secret life, and of course, the aim at a certain point, I mean, I, I got, after I got over the whole glamour of being sent to New York constantly, or Washington DC, or Miami, or wherever, and staying in swanky hotels and meeting famous people, I got severely frustrated with being a journalist, and it was like being on a hamster wheel. So you have abandoned your secret life for the time being? Or no, not abandoned, but how to write, how to use, I think of, I think of my period as a music journalist as being a kind of apprenticeship in being able to talk to people about stuff they didn't like and persuade them that there was something in it. Yes. You know? I mean, that's one of the things you learn you, if you work for newspapers and fashionable magazines. <laughs> How to write about stuff that people have never heard of and they think they don't like in a way that's engaging. And it's a great apprenticeship, actually. Um, I learned a lot from that, even though I began to hate it. And so my goal became, how can I write about this stuff that is, you know, kind of from my heart, yes. in a more, not for tiny magazines, you know, self-produced magazines, but um, to a bigger audience, without compromising um, what I believed about it. And um, that's really how Ocean of Sound came about. I'd, I'd written some, I was very fascinated about ambient music the first time I heard about it because it was people playing um, bird song and um, Strauss waltzes and Brian Eno records in clubs where the rest of the music was frenetic acid house. And I thought, hmm, that's why, interesting. Why was that happening? What was, uh, what? Uh, the, a lot of drugs were involved in that scene, and, um, <laughs> and the music was very crazy and frenetic. And people decided it would be a good idea if you had a room for, first of all, for late 80s, just to late 80s, yeah. yeah. First of all, mm -hmm. it would be for the kind of uh, celebrity bit of the crowd, you know, the the people who could pass beyond the velvet rope, and they could go and chill out in this room and let's have another DJ in there, but it didn't make sense to play frenetic, crazy acid house music in there. So people got the idea to play this um, first generation ambient music or bird song, you, you know, and I why did Why did you find it interesting? Like why, what well, because, it, that? because it kind of connected with this, my secret life, you know, where I was listening to bird song and I was, you know, I was listening to bioacoustics, and I was listening to, uh, you know, I'd worked with Brian Eno, and in 1975, you know, I'd recorded for his label, and there was a very experimental feeling then. There was a real, you know, the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, this conservatism of the 80s suddenly broke open, and for one thing, people had an interest in each other, you know, I talked earlier on about identity and um, genre divisions and uh, what goes in what rack in the record shop and so on. And suddenly people were interested in other people's genres. How, how did that happen? Like, just since we're in an academy here, it was a bit of a cultural background for this, for this uh, shift. I think, I think how it happened was very complicated and uh, to some extent it was a political shift. Um, you know, if you think specifically about the UK, um, there had been this dominant right-wing government um, and there was a strong resistance growing to that and the, uh, the 80s came to be associated with an idea of materialism and greed. Um, and there was a strong resistance growing to that as well. 
and um, the music business um, kind of found its commercial mojo again in the 1980s. You know, pop singles became popular again. And there was a growing resistance to that. And um, the, um, the idea that it was fashionable to listen to other people's music, you know, through um, festivals like WOMAD, yes. also became uh, a thing that was commented upon and, and became a kind of quite a big movement. So there, I think there were many different things happening at the same time that when you're in when you're in these situations, you don't really grasp what it is. You can only understand it retrospectively. But, but so then you get to start getting interested by ambient music, and how did this interest develop then? Well, I was writing, you know, I was going to Amsterdam, for example, and writing about uh, ambient events for the face, and um, I thought I can write a book about this. Um, because I knew the history. It was the same as me writing a book about hip-hop. It was, I could write a book about hip-hop because I knew the history of African-American music because since I was a young teenager, I've been listening to jazz, blues, R&B, gospel, and so on. And so I knew that history. I knew where the music had come from. I was interested in African-American oral traditions. So um, I understood where, I understood that hip-hop wasn't just a passing fad of kids breakdancing, you know, I understood that it had deep roots in African American culture. And it was the same with ambient music, you know, this 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 thing of playing weird records in chill out rooms didn't come from nowhere. And it had twentieth century antecedents and I thought one of the interesting themes in ambient <coughs> music was immersiveness. And that seemed to be a characteristic of a great deal of 20th century music of, of many different kinds. Immersiveness as in delving into a special a sound world, a specific... A music that, uh, whose purpose is to mm. envelop us. Yes. You know, you think of John, some of John Cage's pieces, mm. for example, Variations 4, you know, where we're just absolutely swamped in, in sound. Or you think of free jazz pieces like Machine Gun by Peter Brotsman Octet, you know, where it just kind of pulverizes you with with noise. Um, I mean, there are many, many examples. And then this, this idea of liquidity. And I went back to Debussy, and I thought that was an interesting starting point. You know, Debussy at the Paris Exposition at the end of the 19th century, suddenly hearing all this music from Java, um, from Siam, as it was then called, Thailand, and I think from China, and uh, there was African music, and but you know the one that really um, impressed, made an impression on Debussy was the, the Javanese music, and um, you know he made this extraordinary statement that in certain respects this music was superior to European music, and for a European to say that at that time was. Um, you know, I've got a remarkable thing because the prevailing view, and of course the colonial exhibitions express that view, was that other people were inferior. Yes. You know, they were savages or barely better than savages, and that would be applied to, you know, a sophisticated, cultured um, region like Indonesia as much as it would be applied to. Um, take me from the Belgian Congo. So, you know, it was a, it was a kind of, um, I saw it as a, you know, one of the possible starting points for 20th century music that you could choose. And so this was, um, like, this was the, the book, this development of the book, and how did the music come from it? Like, the record, like, what, did you take from it, or was it...? Well, one of the frustrations mm -hmm. of books mm -hmm. is that you sit there with this silent object. Um, not so much anymore, of course, but, but you know, then, in the mid-90s, um, that was still very much the case. You sit there with a silent object, and um, in a way, that's, that's a, mm -hmm. an incredible thing. You know, that you can sit there with a silent object, and your world is, your mind is, full of images and 
unspooling text and um, sound and so on. So that's you know one aspect of an incredible human invention. But the other thing is you're you're engaged in the struggle with writing about music and sound, which is mm -hmm. by no means easy. And um, so it felt like a logical step. <laughs> it was suggested to me that um, we made a compilation album. And it was a fantastic opening because it meant that I could put together all of these different, not only genres of music, but also bioacoustic sounds yes. that I'd written about in Ocean of Sound, like, for, for example, howler monkey sounds, um, or the sounds of seals recorded under Antarctic ice. I could put them together with, you know, Miles Davis and Debussy <coughs> and King Tubby and the Peter Brotsmer Octet and AMM and so on. and. <laughs> hopefully create this don't worry I'm not going to say journey <laughs> this passage that's just as bad as that <laughs> that you could you could draw people in I mean this is where the journalism apprenticeship comes yes. in you know the thing about journalism is if your first sentence is rubbish Forget about it. Okay, so your first sentence has got to be good. And um, it's what I tell my PhD students. If your first sentence is terrible, then somebody's got to read 60,000, 80,000 of your words with a sinking heart. You know, <laughs> you know, a good first sentence is a great thing. And it's the same thing with putting together a compilation of music like that. that you draw people in and then they'll follow it through, hopefully, and I remember doing this radio interview um, about the CD, and it was on drive time radio, so, mm. <laughs> and the guy was quite enthusiastic, the, the radio DJ was quite enthusiastic, and he, he said to me, he said, that Peter Brotsman track, is, he said, it's like boiling your head in acid, <laughs> and I thought that was, you know, he, he just couldn't understand this music, but he had actually heard it, you know, he discovered it, so he had been drawn into this flow of music and it had lead him, led him into discovering music that he would never for a moment listen to in any other situation. So is it a bit, this is what you, what you just said, like you have a good phrase and then you work on it. From what we were talking a bit earlier today about how you work with sound, how you work with your own compositions, could this same procedure be somehow valid, like you work from one, because sometimes I have the impression that there is, that in your, in your work or in your books is like one, one special sound, one special universe that is expanded, expanded upon. Yeah. How, how do you see it, how do you see it happening, how, is your, how can you compare, let's say, this, the way you compile the record or the way you create a book around the topic with the way you work with sound and your compositions. Could you? Can you? Can you do it? Well, I think it's a kind of organic um, branching process, and it, it comes from me being um, from having a very little education. Um, and when I say that, I'm you know I'm quite serious about it, and I'm not saying it to show off. You know, I think it's a bad thing, but. You know, for various reasons, um, my education was something of a catastrophe, and um, so most of what I do is kind of intuitive and self-taught, and I think autodidacts have a, you know, particular uh, strengths and flaws, but, you know, identifiable place in the world of ideas and actions and um, one of the ways in which I work is to begin exactly as you say with um, a thought or a sound and it develops into something far more far bigger and more complex than the original starting point and that's for example 
the complete opposite of the way you would um, undergo a doctorate, you know, which is much more structured. And, um, I can't work that way. Um, it's not in my makeup. Um, I've tried, but I can't work in that way. So, um, it's almost a question of going into a trance, and this is, I think, relevant to the piece on Tuesday of yes. Leonardo da Vinci. Um, it's, it's like inducing a trance, and then it begins a flow, um, and hopefully that flow will be cohesive and will be engaging and will carry people with it. And, you know, it's... I think with a book, it's not an easy thing. I mean, books are hard, however you write them, and whatever your approach. And, um, but I've just finished the first volume of a two-volume book on free improvisation, which um, was extremely difficult uh, for me, um, because it's a very complex story. And um, this, this, I, this model of following intuition, it, it, it's kind of walking a tightrope all the time, you know, where it would be extremely easy to just fall off and the whole project collapse. And what, in what sense? How do you understand that? If you lose the thread, or if you uh, can't induce this kind of intuitive trance, then nothing happens. And are there techniques, strategies? To keep yeah, you of course, there, I have watching. yeah, I have secret mm -hmm. methods. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but mm -hmm. they're kind of, um, I guess, straight edge methods. You know, I don't drink anymore, and I don't take drugs, and uh, <laughs> I don't do any of that stuff. So yeah, I mean, I have, um, I have ways of uh, inducing it. I th I think some of which comes from the sense of emergency that goes with being a journalist. You know, that uh, when you're a journalist, I mean, the perfect example of this I can give is that when I was working for a newspaper as a journalist many years ago, on a Sunday afternoon, I was just kind of relaxing with my family and I got a phone call and an editor said to me, <coughs> Eric Clapton's died in a helicopter crash. Can you write 600 words now? I mean, I had virtually no interest in Eric Clapton. In fact, I had a strong dislike for Eric Clapton, partly because I think he's a racist. And, you know, I, I idolized the people that he copied. You know, people like B.B. King and Buddy Guy when I was a young teenager. So, immediately you're faced with this wall and you know that you have to do it. Yes. So I started writing this 600 word piece on Eric Clapton. About half an hour later I got a phone call saying it's not Eric Clapton, it's Robert Cray. <laughs> <laughs> I had even less interest in Robert Cray because Robert Cray struck me as being a kind of 80s blues singer, you know, who's kind of, I don't know, sucked the life out of blues. Yes. You know. So okay, scrap the Eric Clapton. I mean, you know, this, this word integrity is beginning to flash in neon in front of your eyes at this point. You know, how cheap can you get? Anyway, what do I know about Robert Cray? Nothing. So I begin my 600 words. But the sense of emergency, I think, is interesting because it's a bit... I haven't finished my story. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Half an hour later, I get a phone call saying, it was actually Stevie Ray Vaughan, and we're not interested in him. <laughs> so it's like... Okay, I just wasted my Sunday afternoon and felt totally cheap about myself. And you know that sense of emergency, sorry to interrupt you, no, but that I, sense I, of I emergency, don't, don't think it, could continue this time. it becomes embedded in you, mm. you know, and you can call it up. Yes, but, um, but I, would, I wonder if that's, like, this was one of my, of my curiosities, like the sense of emergency, is it the same type, is it the same when you work as an improviser and when you compose, or like it leads me to my, to, 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 how do you define your work as an improviser as you work as a composer? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think as an improviser you work in a state of emergency. Um, improvisation is much more to do with empath empathy, 
mm. and um, a kind of a collective responsibility and um, practice, and by that I mean practice in all senses of the word. Um, the, the practice of living improvisation is something that becomes a part of who you are, and uh, so it's something that you can do not necessarily always successfully by any means, but it's something you can do whenever the occasion demands. And the occasion demanded is that you have a commitment to a performance and there is an audience there or there is at least an empty space there and, you know, you've committed to doing it, so you do it. And you work with, um, I mean, this afternoon, working on Camille's piece, there were musicians I'd never met before, you know, but you know how to do it because it's a lifetime. You know, I'm 66 now. I've been doing it since I was 20, yes. 19. So you build up a bit of history with it. Um, but I don't think you're in a state of panic. Um, and when I work with students in improvisation, um, one of the things I try to inculcate in them through practice and through a verbal analysis is um, a move away from panic into um, beginning to listen more closely to what other people are doing and focus less on the act of doing oneself. You know, so to move in a sense away from what can be a very selfish position to a much more generous position. And, and that for a lot of them is a real challenge. And for a lot of them I have to say it's also a real breakthrough um, at a personal level, not just at the level of musical practice, you know, that they, they learn how to get on with their peers better, you know, and how to work together with people better. Yes. And how do you combine, let's say for example, in Leonardo or in your scenic works, how do you combine elements of improvisation with elements of composition, or are, is it a comp composed, notated work, and in that case, how no. the notation looks like? Well, as I said mm -hmm. earlier, you know, I had these conversations with Harry Burtwistle mm -hmm. about notation, and yes. mm -hmm. he said, you know, whatever you can do to communicate an idea to other people that has some semblance of your original intention is a kind of notation. And I found that a very kind of wise and actually generous um, contribution to my thinking because, you know, Harry was incredibly skeptical about what I was doing. You know, he hated the idea of, of computers and all that stuff. It's like, oh, no, get computers away from me. But, you know, that was what he said to me. And, uh, I thought, well, okay, I have to devise ways of doing this. And the way to do it was based on experience in, in teaching improvisation. Yes. Um, that I could workshop pieces. I could prepare a composition in the computer. And I could write a libretto. And I could um, make suggestions of, of what I was lis listening for by, um, for example, sending people recordings of singers I liked. You know, I mean, I remember I sent the opera singers um, maybe ten recordings of singers I liked, including the um, Korean Pansori singer, An Suk Sun, you know, who expressed a kind of intensity um, that I was looking for, you know, intensity combined with a kind of storytelling. Um, and then to workshop the thing, you know, to begin and say, okay, this is what we're doing, and this is where my ideas have come from, and this is what I'm looking for, and let's see what happens. And at the end, if you want it to be performed again, would you have to be there? Is there material, some kind of notation that other performers could relate? Well, Ovli, Ovli and I is an interesting example, because for the performance here in Ultima, in Oslo, um, Elaine had started working with a choreographer, um, Don Van Hoon, a uh, Vietnamese choreographer, because she was very interested in the movement. And um, I said, can you come to the rehearsals? And I said, I, you know, it's your piece now. You've performed it. Yes. You've sung it 
a number of times, you've recorded it, um, you know, it, it becomes your piece. You know, so it's a collaborative piece. And I think the nature of this piece, because there's a video artist photographer involved, and there's a choreographer involved, and there's a singer who's improvising, and then there's my component, it's very much a collaborative piece. And one of the things that really um, I feel committed to is collaboration. You know, most of my work now is collaborative. So it means that if someone else wanted to perform this piece, it would become, almost have to become another project, or another piece. How do you see Yeah, that? I think there's a parallel with, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the Fluxus pieces of the early 1960s. Um, they were so open that, I mean, I'm actually performing um, a Fluxus piece from 1961 by Miyako Shiomi, the boundary music at the Whitechapel Gallery on Saturday with some of my students and, yes. and two uh, artists, musicians, Ria Nakajima and, and Harry Davis. And um, I've talked about, I've talked to Miyako Shomi about that piece. I emailed her about it and she says, oh, yeah, that's nice, you're doing it. And she has nothing else to say, you know, no advice, no thought on what the piece is about, she just says, oh yeah, thank you, that's nice. <laughs> and I think that's in the spirit of those pieces, you know, that they become something that can be reinterpreted over history, and yet somehow they always have the character of the era, the artist, you know, the feeling of the times and what people hope to achieve with those pieces, the, you know, the political context of that time, because you know, those pieces from uh, the artists that have come out of Group on Gaku, um, Takahisa Kosuki, Mieko Shiomi, and Yasun Antone, they, you know, they had a political significance, which was about American occupation of Japan. So, you know, and the whole discourse around that. So, you know, so there are traces of all of these, uh, you know, historical ingredients that somehow survive in these pieces which are basically somebody saying, go and do something, <laughs> yes. you know? And I think that's remarkable, really. Um, but I also think it's about letting things go. And one of the things that recurs in Leonardo's notebooks is this phrase, which he says in different ways, um, Tell me, is anything ever finished? And, you know, I mean, it's, it's something we have to live with in many different aspects of life, particularly as you get older. I was in Australia a couple of years ago with a friend of mine, Lawrence English, and we were driving, and he said to me, you know, when you die, you're going to have loads of unfinished projects. <laughs> It was so blunt, you know, it was like, <laughs> oh, thanks, Lawrence. Uh, <laughs> um, but, of course, it's, it's true, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where you think, okay, I'm done, I've, I've done everything I want, now I'll just sit and wait to die. You know, you want to be in a situation where you think, oh, I've got to finish this book, uh, you know, I've got, you know, two volumes about birdsong, you know, that I, I, what am I going to do with this? And uh, there's all this stuff I want to do. And, and, and you die, and, and it's for other people to work it out. And I think Leonardo was, you know, I mean, that has many implications in what he was talking about. Maybe it has implications in terms of the proliferation of phenomena, you know, that is one of this, the aspects of this piece, um, particularly in the video piece, I think, you know, that there's just this abundance of phenomena. In, in 1978, I went to the rainforest in southern Venezuela to record Yanomami shamanism. And um, one of the things that was so extraordinary and so difficult about being in that environment was just the proliferation of phenomena. You know, you put your hand out to steady yourself and it's suddenly covered with red biting ants. And it's like everything you touch is, and everything you feel is life, you know, and there is a s there's something in this about 
maybe our future. You know, we talk, the theme of this festival is nature. And um, I just read this uh, very interesting book called, recently read this very interesting book called Hyperobjects by Timothy Morton. And his idea is that we should get rid of the idea of nature. And it's expressed by Bernie Krauss, actually, um, in the catalogue, you know, that we should get rid of the idea of nature because this divides us, you know, and, and so one of the root problems of our environmental, um, worsening environmental conditions is our sense of separateness from this, this object called nature. And um, I think Leonardo was very alive to this. You know, his, his notebooks are just kind of teeming with life. And he was interested in everything. And he was trying to give representations of everything, and analyze everything, and understand everything. And, um, you know, then also he was preoccupied with cataclysms. You know, he was preoccupied with the flood. And um, he had these extraordinary visions of rampaging black giants and incidentally while we were recording um, uh, of Leonardo da Vinci um, war broke, up, broke out in Libya so uh, we talk about you know, we we're talking about prophecy early on but you know the prophetic aspects of this was so um, compelling somehow so um, you know the sense of almost dissolving into phenomena, which of course is what happens when you die. You know, it's not just your projects that are scattered to the winds and unfinished, but it's it's you who become a kind of unfinished project and you you join the immensity of hyper objects to borrow Timothy Moore's expression and um, you become this kind of floating dust, you know, for people to understand either through the archive or um, reinvention or forgetting. But um, talk about unfinished projects, yeah, looking at the time, just one. I'm seeing that this I will need to keep all the questions I have still for another occasion and for the concert on Tuesday. Of course, I think this will this all probably make us all curious too.